chapter twenty nine of beyond these voices this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org beyond these voices by mary elizabeth braddon chapter twenty nine everything was dead that had been vera's answer when claude asked despairingly if love was dead the words were in her mind now as she stood alone in the room where her poets and her actors and her philosophers looked at her from the white walls and where the sound of the great hall door closing heavily as her husband shut it behind him was still in her ears had he gone for ever was it indeed the end could love that had begun in ecstasy close in this grey calm she felt neither sorrow nor anger everything was dead she stood among the ruins of her life feeling as a child might feel when the house she has built of cards shatters suddenly and falls at her feet everything was over she had no thought of building another house no desire to patch up a broken life and begin again perhaps her husband loved her still and it was the gloom of this haunted house that had driven him to seek distraction in a baser love it was her fault perhaps and she ought to be sorry for him poor claude she remembered his gaiety the airy mockery that had enchanted her the quick wit that had struck fire and light out of dull things she remembered the joyous nature the light laughter the inexhaustible energy which made difficult things in the way of sport seem easy yes they had been happy utterly happy in the life of the moment shutting out every thought that was irksome every memory that hurt and it was all over and dead and she had nothing left but the shadows in this room the dead faces the words of those who were not that scriptural phrase had always moved her he was not her afternoons in mr simeon's library had been all she had cared for in the season that was ending she had gone wherever her husband asked her to go and had given the entertainments he wanted her to give but through all that brilliant summer she had gone about like a corpse alive that dreary simile had been in her mind sometimes when she thought of herself sitting in her victoria dressed as only the well-bred englishwoman with unlimited money can be dressed lovely in her fragile fairness admired and talked about she had gone about and held her own in a quiet way among crowds of clever men and women and her life had seemed to her like the end of a long dream her only vital interest had been in the voices she heard in francis simeon's shadowy room those voices were of living men and women but the words were the words of the dead she was not utterly unhappy the past was past and she had left off grieving over it for now she had a transcendent hope in the near future the hope of death she would soon have passed the river that they had passed guilia and her father the gate through which they had gone to a higher stage in the upward path of life would open for her and no matter by what slow ascent no matter with what feeble steps she would climb the mountain up which they had gone those emancipated spirits she had known for a long time that she was marked for death she had no specific ailment but in this last season she had felt her vanishing life felt the painless ebb of vitality and had measured by a flight of stairs by a pathway in the park where she walked sometimes in the early morning the waning strength of limbs and heart the dreadful sleeplessness of the first year of her widowhood had returned and her nights were almost entirely spent in thought and reading her brain never resting her heart seldom quiet although she looked forward to death as release she could not escape the boredom of medical treatment lady oak hampton whose daughters were all married and wanted nothing from parental affection except to be allowed to go their own way and not to be obliged to invite mummy 
to their choicest parties devoted herself more and more to her favourite niece who wasn't actually her niece but only a first cousin once removed since in those last days at disbrow she had seen the mark of death on vera's pale forehead aunt mildred who was really a warm-hearted woman had interested herself keenly in the vanishing life and had made unremitting efforts to combat the enemy she has simply wasted her life since her second marriage she said she has wasted her life as recklessly as claude has wasted her money but she shan't die without my making an effort to save her even if i have to take every specialist in london to portland place you'd better take her to the specialist said his lordship it would save your time and her money as if money mattered you could telephone for appointments and do the whole of grosvenor street and savile row in a morning with a good taxi a taxi when my niece has two superb daimlers no by the by the last claude showed me is an s c a t poor provana sighed oakhampton to think that nothing could induce him to buy a motor-car although he was a man to whom moments are money it was one of his few eccentricities to worship his horses he might have been here now if he had not been quite so fussy about his horses sighed her ladyship what do you mean he might not have used the door between the house and the stables the door by which he and his murderer came into the house on that awful night true assented her husband it was an infernally unlucky door and i suppose if poor little vera dies they'll carry her out that way to be cremated oakhampton you are too bad whoever said she was to be cremated nobody but it's the modern way isn't it and of course everything would be up to date how can you be so heartless and how can you use that odious expression up to date well i hope the poor girl will be warned in time and live to make old bones but she didn't look like it at her last party you'd better give her husband a good wigging it will be more useful than calling in the specialists i am utterly disgusted with claude he is throwing her money out of windows and behaving atrociously into the bargain i suppose you mean mrs ballenden well my dear that was bound to come vera has been too much in the clouds for the last year from what susan amphlett told me of her way of life in rome she was bound to lose her husband no man can stomach neglect from a wife unless all the other women neglect him and claude rutherford is not a negligible quantity lady oakhampton had tried her hand upon her young kinsman before this colloquy with her lord and had found him hopeless he turned the point of her lectures with a jest he was light as vanity he protested that his wife was alone to blame he adored her and thought no other woman upon this planet her equal in charm and beauty but since she had taken up with simeon and his spooks she had surrounded herself with an atmosphere of sadness that would send the most devoted husband to the primrose path in sheer revolt against the gloom of his house we are poor creatures he said and we have to be amused once only in the course of numerous wiggings did claude show anything like strong feeling and then emotion came in a tempest that scared his mild kinswoman she had talked to him about his wife's health there is absolutely wasting away she said something must be done or she will not live till the end of the year no 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 he cried my god what do you mean is that to be the end is death to take her from me and leave me in this black world alone you have no right to say such a thing by what authority who has told you that she is in failing health i see her every day she never complains you must be blind if you don't see the change in her i don't believe there is anything seriously wrong she is as lovely as ever no i don't believe it you are cruel to come here and frighten me she is all i have in the world all all do you understand his head drooped suddenly upon the table by which he was sitting and she heard his hoarse sobs tearing his throat and chest and saw his long thin fingers writhing among his hair the boyish auburn hair with a glint of gold in it that foolish women had praised 
there is no need for despair claude i only wanted to awaken you to the seriousness of the case we shall save her in spite of herself i see you are still fond of her and yet and yet i have been a brute a senseless idiotic beast but that's all over lady okehampton I love her i would lie outside her door like that dog of hers all through the long night only to get a smile and a touch of her hand in the morning love her i loved her for five patient years loved her passionately and kept myself in check and behaved like an elder brother i the man no woman could trust love her the picture of her childish prettiness at disbrow was in my memory when i was going to the devil at simla you don't know what men are made of you only know the model english gentleman like your husband oakhampton has never given me any trouble except in his young days when he used to ride dangerous horses i know i have been exceptionally fortunate in my husband and of course i know that modern husbands and wives are utterly unlike us but i must say that your behaviour at your wife's last party was inexcusable the dear princess was sadly huffed and i doubt if vera will ever get her to her house again i don't think vera will try but she ought to try the princess hermione has been perfectly sweet about her vera doesn't care that's her worst symptom that i know of she has left off caring about things and that is a very bad symptom said lady okehampton when jagford's wife showed signs of it i bundled her off to a nursing home for six weeks and she came out of it just in time for ascot and as keen as mustard as jagford said in his vulgar way she had been dieted and massaged and not allowed to see any one but her nurses and she was quite cured of not caring she romped with her children and ate jam pudding like one of them ah you see there were children sighed claude there was something for her to come back to vera and you ought to have had a family it is very disappointing said aunt mildred and the tone implied that when she said disappointing she meant reprehensible never mind she went on presently in a more hopeful tone don't be downhearted claude if doctors can cure her she shall be another woman before the end of the year you love doctors much better than i do said claude grasping her hands find the man who can cure her and i will worship him after this vera entered upon a wide acquaintance with the fashionable specialist the man who was invincible in treatment of lung trouble the only authority upon cardiac disorders the man who knew more about the nervous system than any other physician in europe the man who had given his life to the study of the digestive organs the hypnotic doctor and the mesmerist and finally as a condescension the all-round or common-sense man who might be consulted about anything and sometimes as it were by rule of thumb succeeded where the specialists had failed these gentlemen came to portland place at irregular intervals through the month of august vera resolutely refusing to leave london in that impossible month and lady oakhampton again sacrificing her annual cure to the care of her niece as she had done in the year of mario provana's unhappy death lady oakhampton having made this sacrifice almost the greatest which a woman of her age and position could make naturally allowed herself some slight compensation in fussiness she talked about her niece's health to boring point with her familiar friends with the result of booking the name and address of some infallible specialist hitherto unknown to her and this accounted for the spasmodic appearance of a new consultant once or twice a week in vera's morning-room all through that impossible month in which the doctors themselves were panting for escape from london to shoot grouse in scotland or do their own cures in bohemia after a season of hard dining vera was curiously submissive to these frequent ordeals she answered any questions that the great man asked her but she never volunteered information about herself and she always made light of her ailments the admission of a little worrying cough that was at its worst at night a slight palpitation of the heart after going upstairs was all that could be obtained from her by the most subtle questionings but lungs and heart told their own story without words she smiled when the nerve specialist asked if she slept well and again when he suggested certain harmless opiates which would ensure beneficent slumber she had taken them all she had exhausted susan amphlett's pharmacopoeia which contained all these specifics and others not so harmless 
when one physician after another for on this they were all agreed told her that she ought not to be in london in this sultry depressing weather while each advised his pet health resort she smiled sweetly and said she meant to remain in london till november when she would go back to rome i am fond of this house she said and the london air suits me london air is very good air answered dr selwyn tower who understood her better than the various new lights but not in august and september if you are to be in rome in november why not spend the interval in italy at verisi for instance a charming spot with every advantage no vera was not to be persuaded i like the quiet of this house after the season all i want is rest and silence she said and dr selwyn tower shot a despairing glance at lady oakhampton your niece is absolutely charming but as obstinate as a mule he told her when they had their conference in one of the drawing-rooms all the doors and portieres were open and the doctor looked at the long vista of splendid emptiness with a faint shudder it is a fine house but a little depressing he murmured i call it positively uncanny but that is all in my niece's line she is dreadfully morbid i am glad there was no occultism or christian science when i was young at these words christian science the famous consultant shuddered worse than at sight of the empty rooms if your sweet niece is that way inclined we can do nothing for her he said no thank heaven that is not one of her fads and then the fashionable physician gave his opinion of the case or just so much of his opinion as he thought it good to give to an affectionate but not overwise aunt he found that the patient's strength was at a very low ebb she had been wasting her resources living upon her capital refusing herself the rest that was essential for so fragile a form so sensitive a temperament and so overactive a brain lady oakhampton had told him of the gaieties the rush from place to place from amusement to amusement the everlasting entertaining and being entertained and he talked as if he had been there watching and taking notes all through that wild career he was not going to extinguish hope so he kept up a cheerful tone throughout the conference there was nothing heroic in the treatment required rest and a soothing regimen not much walking but a great deal of fresh air drives in her open carriage to rural suburbs if she should insist on remaining in london a little quiet society the utmost care as to diet and constant medical supervision he would be glad to confer with mrs rutherford's regular medical man before he left london and he hoped on his return in three or four weeks to find a marked improvement this was all when questioned as to lung trouble he said that there was trouble but he saw no fatal indications yes there was heart weakness but nothing that might not be modified by care simple as she was lady oakhampton did not feel altogether assured by all this bland talk and the sound of the doctor's carriage wheels as they rolled away from the door recalled the moaning of the winter waves under the red cliffs at disbrow she repeated the specialist's diplomatic utterances to claude who did not seem to attach much importance to medical opinion all doctors talk alike he said i don't think vera's is a case for the faculty you remember what macbeth said to his physician lady oakhampton did not remember but she gave a sigh of assent that answered as well i'm afraid vera's is a rooted sorrow and god help me i cannot pluck it from her memory we had better leave her alone we can do nothing more for her we can't make her happy claude this is too dreadful are we to let her die cried aunt mildred with something like an elderly shriek is death so great an evil at least it means rest and there are some of us who can get rest no other way claude it is positively dreadful to hear you talk like that as if you cared for nothing in this life i don't and then lady oakhampton took him in hand severely and talked to him as a good woman but as a philistine of the philistines would naturally talk on such an occasion and after remonstrating with him for his want of religious feeling and even proper affection went on to reproaching him for spending his wife's money squandering her magnificent fortune with a reckless wastefulness that might end in reducing her to beggary 
no fear of that aunt mildred no doubt i have thrown money out of windows money has never been a serious consideration with vera and me we should have been quite as happy when we started on our venetian honeymoon if we had had only just enough to pay for our tourist tickets and our gondola just enough for the gondola and a cheap hotel money could buy us nothing that we cared for later when i knew what her income was i spent with a free hand but there's a good deal of spending in a hundred thousand a year lady oakhampton shivered and stirred in her seat uneasily that colossal income and nothing done for the needy members of her husband's illustrious house i wanted to amuse myself and to amuse my wife and amusements are costly nowadays so the money has run out pretty fast but there has always been a handsome surplus i see mr zabulon the banker one of my wife's trustees two or three times a year and he has never complained vera's charities are immense so there is really nothing for you to moan about lady oakhampton nothing cried vera's aunt with uplifted hands was there ever any one so feather-headed so feckless can you forget that when your wife dies her fortune dies with her no but when she dies i shall have done with all that money can buy i shall be able to pension the old stable hands and provide for my dogs out of my fifteen hundred a year and i can give my trainer half a dozen cracks that will make him comfortable for life you are very considerate about your stable and kennels i wonder if you have ever considered vera's obligations to those who come after her if you mean the roman cater cousins i certainly have not provana's heirs why of course not they will be inordinately rich when that splendid fortune is chopped up among them no claude if you had a proper family feeling which to my mind is an essential element in the christian life you would have thought of our herd of poor relations nicholas disbrow dying by inches in an east anglian vicarage and not daring to winter in the south for want of means or poor lady rosalba who is no better off than vera's grandmother and doesn't make half as good a fight as poor lady felicia did or mary disbrow jones who marries so wretchedly and is selling blouses in a shabby street in pimlico i think vera has done a lot for all of em i know she sent the reverend nicholas a thousand pounds last winter when his wife wrote her a doleful letter and she gave her blouse-making cousin two hundred and fifty pounds last week to save her from bankruptcy consider them forsooth do you suppose they don't ask to be considered every man jack of them down to the remotest connection by marriage they are as eloquent with the pen as professional begging letter writers they blister their papers with tears and vera never refuses she does not know how oh i know she is generous a thousand to that worthy man in the fens was handsome but that kind of casual help won't provide for the future and when our poor dear is gone there will be nothing may that sad day be long long off but in the meantime she ought to invest her surplus income and leave it to those who want it most and would use it best you may be sure i have no personal feeling but the best of us are not too well off and if there should come the general election that we are threatened with i doubt if chagford will be able to stand for north devon the ballot has made bribery more audacious and more expensive than ever i am told three half-crowns is the least the wretches will take they will ride a candidate's motor to death and then go and vote for his opponent let chagford talk to my wife if there's a dissolution said claude with a half-smothered yawn that expressed weariness and disgust dear is always kind sighed lady oakhampton dolefully but she refrained from suggesting that when the dissolution came vera might not be there this was aunt mildred's last attack upon claude rutherford he took matters into his own hands after this and no longer depended upon accounts of his wife's health at second hand he took all information upon that subject from dr selwyn tower who had a great reputation at that period and whom he was inclined to trust the physician was more frank with the husband than he had been with the aunt though even yet he said nothing to extinguish hope he told mr rutherford that it would have been better for his wife to winter in the south or by way of experiment to try a short winter in the engadine coming down to ragaz before the snow melted but as the dear lady seemed strangely bent upon staying in her own house it would be safer to indulge her fancy lungs and heart were only a question of weakness the mind was of serious consequence and everything must be done to check the tendency to melancholia 
if we can make her happy we shall be able to deal with the lung trouble said the physician open air and good spirits might work a miracle dr tower naturally inquired as to parental history and was somewhat disheartened on hearing that the dear lady's father and mother had died young the former of galloping consumption during an open-air cure yet even this did not induce him to pronounce sentence of death nor did he allow mrs rutherford to support herself a desperate case though he insisted on having a trained nurse and of the best in attendance upon his patient as well as the maid louison the french girl might be all that mrs rutherford could require he admitted when vera told him she wanted no one else but you must allow me what i want pleaded dr tower with his most ingratiating air my treatment is of the mildest nothing heroic or troublesome about it but i must be sure that it is followed i must have some one about you who is responsible to me my nurse shall not be allowed to bore you if she is intrusive or disagreeable to you you can telephone to me and she shall be superseded within the hour vera submitted her indifference to most things even to those that concerned herself was one of her symptoms which made dr tower uneasy this woman will never help to cure herself he thought as he drove away with that far-off look in vera's face impressed upon his mind she does not want to get well she is not absolutely unhappy only indifferent something must have gone wrong in her life yet her husband does not seem a bad sort she was not unhappy she had been allowed to take her own way and to live as she wished to live in the silence and peace of the spacious house where the business of entertaining seemed to be at an end for ever whatever had been amiss in the life that was ebbing away seemed hardly to matter now that she was drawing near the other life her husband came and went and spent a good deal of time in a room talking with her or reading to her when she was too tired to talk there had been nothing said of his offence against her no utterance of that other woman's name they were friends again and could talk of the things that they loved literature music art of henry irving's hamlet of millay and browning both of whom she had seen at aunt mildred's house in her childhood and whose faces she remembered of books new and old they were as friendly and sympathetic as they had been in mario provana's lifetime before the dawn of love it was as if they were still at the same platonic stage all that had come after was like a lurid dream from which they had awakened tristram was again the true knight isult was sinless all that was best in claude rutherford was in the ascendant during these long slow weeks of silent sorrow in which he knew that the man with the scythe was at the door that nothing money could buy or love devise could save the woman he loved he had broken finally with that other woman finally for the fiery cup had lost its intoxicating power and the end had been a vulgar quarrel about money whatever was to happen to him he was safe from that siren's spells all his natural sweetness his sympathy and charm were for vera in those quiet weeks of september and october when there was nobody in london and the chariot wheels rolled no more in the broad roadway he was at his best in his wife's white morning-room where the faces of the immortals looked down upon him and where he was kind even to the dog she loved the irish terrier brought home after his half-year's quarantine who stretched his strong limbs and rough red-brown body against her satin slippers as she lay on her sofa a fragile figure shadowy in her loose white gown all that was best in this man the tenderness the sympathy was in evidence now a failure no doubt trivial and shallow incapable of deep feeling perhaps but a sweet lovable nature a nature that had made women love him whether he wanted their love or not it is very good of you to give me so much of your time vera said one day slipping her thin little hand into his which was almost as thin invalids are wretched company and i don't want you to have too much of this dull room i do not find it dull and it is no duller for me than for you it is never dull for me i have my faces they are always company your faces you mean those portraits byron scott browning yes they are always company i have looked at them till they are alive i have read walter scott's journals and byron's letters till i know them as well as if they had been my intimate friends when they were alive i know browning's letters by heart those sweet letters to the sweet wife shakespeare is different it is so sad that there are no familiar records one can only think of him as the poet and the creator genius that touches the supernatural i don't think it matters how little you know of the man his deer-stalking or his tardy marriage as long as you don't think 
there was no shakespeare and that the noblest poetry this world ever saw was written by the skunk who gave away his friend said her husband bacon horrible on one quiet evening when claude had been with her since his solitary dinner she said softly i sometimes forget all the years and think you are just the same cousin claude who took pity on me at disbrow when i was so shy that other people's kindness only made me miserable till you came i used to creep into any corner with a book rather than mix with my disbrow cousins who were so dreadfully grand and clever precocious geniuses mrs somerville's in the bud who matured into two of the most commonplace women i know and almost as ignorant as susan amphlett said claude but you must not give me so much of your time claude she said gently i love to be with you but i may slip away for the cambridgeshire he said the trivial side of his character coming to the surface she did not even ask if he were personally interested in the race there had been a time when she knew every horse he owned and made most of them her friends rejoicing in their beauty as creatures whom she would have liked to keep for pets rather than to expose them to the ordeal of the turf albeit she had followed their fortunes and speculated upon their chances almost as keenly interested as her husband but now they had become things without shape or meaning like all the rest of the outside world you need not be afraid of leaving me she said i have this good friend to keep me company smoothing boru's rough coat with her soft hand i wish my mother was still in town she would come to you every day she is very good but she and i have never been really friends i know she would be kind but she would talk of painful things i don't want to remember i want to look forward yes he answered in a low voice bending over her and pressing his lips on the pale brow there must be no looking back it was the first time he had kissed her since the night of the concert she looked up at him with a sad sweet smile and he held his hand in hers for a moment susan must come to you every day to keep you in good spirits he said no claude susie doesn't like sick people she sits by my side and chatters and chatters telling me all the scandals she thinks will interest me but i can hear the effort she is making her tongue does not run on as it used before i was ill and once when she saw a spot of blood on my handkerchief she nearly fainted i don't want too much of susy mr simeon will come and talk to me sometimes and his talk always does me good i wish i could think so i hate leaving you in london you ought to have gone to disbrow as your aunt wished you would have done better in that soft air no i should be better nowhere than in this silent house if i cannot be in rome there is nowhere else where i should like to be i want space and silence and no going and coming of people who mean to be kind and who bore me to death i want no fussing and talking about me i can put up with my nurse because she is quiet and does her work like a machine rome yes in the november afternoons when the world outside her windows was hidden in grey fog she longed for the beautiful city the place of life and light the city of fountains full of the sound of rushing water the dull greyness of london oppressed her when she thought of the long garden walks in their solemn stillness the cypress and ilex the statues gleaming ghostly in the dusk against the dark walls of laurel and arbutus the broad terrace with its massive marble balustrade on which he had leant for hours in melancholy medication thinking 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 as the multitude of church towers and the great dome in the hollow below her changed from grey to purple as the golden light died in the west and the young moon rose above the fading crimson of the afterglow it was sad to think that she would never see that divine city again and all that she had loved in italy Catanabia, where her honeymoon had begun to the sound of rippling water as the boats crept by in the darkness to the music of guitars and italian voices singing in the light of coloured lanterns while the cosmopolitan crowd clustered in the narrow space between the hotel and the lake susan amphlett came nearly every day and insisted upon being admitted she had come to london for a week just to buy frocks for a winter round of visits but much more to see you my dear she said and then she recited the houses to which she was going and her reason for going to them which seemed to be anything rather than any regard for the people she was visiting she talked of herself as if she had been a star actress i am touring in the shires this winter she said i did haunts 
and dorset last year and was bored to extinction roger is happy in any hole if he can be riding to hounds every day and he had the blackmoor vale and the north haunts within his reach most of the time while i was excruciated by a pack of women who talked of nothing but their good works or their bridge and they were such poor players that the good works were less boring than the bridge talk dear lady sue would you call no trumps if and would you do this and t'other questions that babies in the nursery might ask over their toy cards then came a long account of the frocks that were being made for the shires and the scarlet topcoat to be worn with a grey habit which roger hated i think he would like me in an early victorian get-up with the edge of my habit touching my horse's fetlocks a large white muslin collar and a low beaver hat with a long feather those early victorian collars cost two or three pounds apiece my granny told me and those poor wretches who never changed their clothes till dinner wore them all day long and yet they talk of our extravagance as if nobody paid anything for clothes in those days and then when the houses to which she was going and the clothes she was to wear and her quarrels with her husband and her maid had been discussed at length susan began to talk about her friend lady o told me how ill you had been ma mia and of your curious whim about this house she says selwyn tower would have liked you to go to the transvaal and told her that two or three months in that delicious climate would make you a strong woman but finding you set upon stopping in your own house he gave way as your illness is chiefly a question of nerves it is a comfort to know that nespa mine shots yes of course it is a comfort i suppose with nothing amiss but one's nerves one might live to be ninety true dearest quite ninety susan answered shuddering susan amphlett was out of her element in a sick-room the mere thought that the friend she was talking to was marked for death seemed to freeze her blood her own hand grew as cold as the cold hand she was holding she could not be bright and pleasant with death in sight as she sat with vera in the library that had been provana's favourite room she felt as if there were some one standing behind the door in that inner room a door that had been left ajar there was some one waiting there whose unseen presence made her dumb some one not provana but another and more terrible shape vera she burst out at last why do you sit in this horrid room instead of in your sweet white den with byron and browning and all your dear people i like this room better now that my thoughts have gone backwards what can you mean by thoughts going backward now that i know time is measured for me so much and no more i like to live over the days that are gone it spins out my life to live the dead years over again this is the room mario loved his books are on those shelves the books that opened a new world for me the italian historians the italian poets in the first year of our life in this house before i was the fashion we used to sit here of an evening long evenings from nine till midnight talking 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 or mario reading to me he was a banker and a dealer in money but he read poetry exquisitely vera susan ejaculated suddenly and sat staring what's the matter i believe you love provana better than ever you have loved claude i don't know vera said dreamily she had been talking in a dreamy way as if she were hardly conscious that any one was listening to her perhaps you never were really in love with your second husband yes i loved him too much and after a perceptible pause not enough darling i can't make you out i'm not worth making out one thing i must tell you vera even at the risk of agitating you it is all over with that woman which woman which mrs bellenden there's never been so much as a whisper about any other since your marriage oh it is all over i thought so vera what indifference you might be talking of somebody in mars yes dear it is quite at an end they had a desperate quarrel quite the worst of many frightful rows there was furniture smashed i believe sevres and things and now she has consoled herself really a german prince one of the german attaches told me he would marry her if he dared well sweet i must be trudging i'm dining out one of those nice little winter dinners that i love you must make haste and get quite quite well this was what susy always said to a sick friend even when the friend was moribund the quite quite had such a cheering sound 
by the by lady o told me you have had the princess hermione yes she came to see me two or three times when she was passing through town that must have cheered you immensely she is devoted to you quite raves about you i hear in the highest circles get well dear and give a party for her when she is next in town susy kissed her and patted her hair and suppressed a shiver at the cold brow that her lips touched it felt like the brow of death yet vera's eyes were bright and there was a rosy bloom on the thin cheek susan was glad when she had got herself out of the house and was walking fast through the cheerful streets but she was sincerely attached to her friend i shall be fit for nothing this evening she told herself sadly but she was at least fit for her part of chorus and entertained the little dinner-party with a picturesque description of her fading friend dying slowly in that house of measureless wealth her income dies with her she explained and though i suppose a few pennies have been saved out of a hundred thousand a year and my cousin will get all that's left he will be a pauper in a year or two i dare say on this the company speculated upon how much might be left and all were agreed that there was a good deal of spending in a hundred thousand while one of the middle-aged men were so far as to make a rough calculation of the rutherford's expenditure in those five years of expensive pleasures but even after reckoning the dances and dinner-giving the yachts and balloons the racing stable and a certain amount of losses on the turf and at cards they did not bring the annual outlay above eighty thousand whereupon a dowager looked round with a smile and said you haven't reckoned mrs bellenden true now you mention her i take it there would be no surplus and then that remarkable lady and her german prince were discussed at full length dissected rather than discussed for when a woman is remarkable for her beauty and has spent three or four fortunes and is in a fair way of spending another there is a great deal of amusing talk to be got out of her End of chapter twenty nine chapter thirty of beyond these voices this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org beyond these voices by mary elizabeth braddon chapter thirty after susan amphlett's disappearance the house in portland place was given over to silence and solitude lady oakhampton was at disbrow where she was on duty as a model grandmother her daughters liking their children to spend the early winter in the ancestral home where there were exmoor ponies in abundance and plenty of clever grooms to teach the dear kiddies to ride and a superannuated governess of the good old soul or dear old thing order to keep their young minds from rusting and coach them for their next exam whether in music or science lady oakhampton was established in her country house till christmas and claude had turf engagements and shooting engagements enough to occupy him nearly as long he had been reluctant to leave his wife but once away from the silent house he had all manner of distractions to prolong his absence and while newmarket was full of life and anticipations for next year the house in which he had left vera was a place of gloom that had haunted him in troubled dreams and made the thought of return horrible he wrote to her more than once entreating her to let him take her to cannes or nice she could have nurses and invalid carriages to make the journey possible and her health would be renewed in the sunshine but his wife's answer was always to the same effect i am at peace let me be and then he fell back upon his stables and his racing friends or his shooting in suffolk or on cards anything to stop that horror of retrospective thought which had been like a disease with him of late years vera was at peace she had no trivial visitors was not obliged to listen to futile chatter about other people's affairs dr tower came three or four times a week unwilling to confide so precious a life to his watch-dog the general practitioner 
and was cheerful and sympathetic she had two hospital nurses now one always on guard day and night she could no longer maintain her struggle for independence for she too often needed a helping arm to support her as she went up and down the long corridors or toiled slowly up the spacious staircase that had once been alive with the finest people in london but where now the slender figure in a soft silk gown and white fur boa with the nursing cap and uniform moved in a ghostly silence father cyprian hammond came to see her sometimes and sat long and talked delightfully but he who was past master in the art of making proselytes could get no nearer the mind of this woman than he had got a year before whatever her burden was she would not open her heart to him whatever her sense of sin she would not ask him for absolution it was in vain that he told her what his church could do for a penitent the ineffable power possessed by that one holy and ineffable church to heal the wounded heart and to bring the strayed lamb back to the shepherd's arms try to think of yourself in the wilderness and that divine shepherd seeking for you said the priest gently but father cyprian with all his gifts could not win her to confide in him it was only to francis simeon the spiritualist that she ever spoke of the thoughts that filled her mind as she sat alone in the room that had been her husband's dreaming over one of the books he had loved her intimacy with francis simeon had grown closer since the world outside that quiet room had closed upon her for ever since he knew and she knew that the transition from the known to the unknown life was very near he had told her the story of his own sorrows the tragedy of love and death that had made him a mystic and a dreamer whose hopes and convictions the world scoffed at life had given him all the things he desired and last best gift of all the love of a perfect woman who alone could make that life complete for himself and for others lifting him for ever above the sphere of sensual joys and worthless ambitions it was she who had taught him to look beyond the present life and to consider the beauty of the world no more than a screen that concealed the glory of diviner worlds hidden from them only while they were moving along their earthly pilgrimage always looking beyond always dreaming of something better the day came without an hour's warning when he was to be told that her pilgrimage was nearly done the after-life was calling her the divine companions were beckoning all that there had been of high enthusiasm and scorn of life left him in that moment he was as weak and helpless as a mother with her only child her infant child threatened by death the dreamer was no more a dreamer and only the earthly lover remained he who was to have been her husband he hung upon moments he listened to every failing breath he counted time by her ebbing strength and the opinions of doctors he lived only to watch and to listen beside her sofa or in the curtained twilight of her sick-room when the pretty garden parlour was no longer possible wherever she was carried in the vain pursuit of life he went with her the time of alternating hope and dread lasted nearly a year it was our union he told vera it was my only marriage as i sat day after day with her hand clasped in mine i knew that this was all i could ever know of marriage or of woman's love from the day of her death i had done with the world and all the rest of my days were given up to searching for those who had gone for those who were in her world not in mine i have waited at the door as your dog waits when he cannot see you and as he believes that you are there on the other side so i believe and know that she is near me 
and my days have known no other business or interest than my patient search into the books of all ages and nations that help the science of the future life and the society of those people whom you have met in my rooms and who think and feel as i do i am a rich man but i only use money for the relief of distress and i have allowed myself no luxury or indulgence beyond my books and the rooms that are large enough to hold them and me the hospital nurse sat in the adjoining room with the door ajar so far and so far only was the patient allowed the privilege of solitude some one must be always there within hearing when she had a visitor the door might be shut but not otherwise there must be something very dreadful the matter with me she said when dr tower insisted upon this point no my dear lady there is nothing dreadful in a tired heart but i don't want you to faint without anybody at hand to look after you vera assured him that she was not likely to faint and made mock of his care he had been very insistent upon certain points in his treatment which he arranged with the general practitioner who had attended her for minor ailments in earlier days when she was rarely in need of medical care he would not allow her to go up and down stairs any longer that ordeal must be at an end until she was stronger he had the dining-room made into a bedroom for her use all the gloomy old pictures and colossal furniture had been removed and the walls were hung with delicate chintz while the choicest things in her rooms upstairs had been brought down to make this ground-floor apartment pleasant for her a room that smiled as it had never smiled before even on those gala nights when a flood of light shone upon the splendour of georgian silver and venetian glass and diamonds and fashionable women you are taking far too much trouble about me vera said when first she saw this transformation we only want to save you trouble the ascent to the second floor of this lofty house is almost alpine i wonder you never established an electric lift i never minded running up and down stairs she remembered the first years after her second marriage the years of trivial pleasures and hurry and excitement and with how light a step she had gone up and down that stately staircase to give herself over to her parisian maid and to have her smart toilet of the morning changed for the still smarter clothes of the afternoon while she had submitted impatiently with a mind full of worthless things the fashion of her gown the shape of her last new hat that rush from one amusement to another endless hours without pause had been like the morphia maniac's needle it had killed thought all that was left of life now was thought or rather memory for of late thought and memory were one her doctors might do what they liked with her so long as they let her stay in the silent house and did not take away her dog since his return from captivity the terrier had hung about her with a love more devoted even than before their separation he watched her as only a dog can watch the creature it loves he would not let her out of his sight he could not forget how he had been kept away from her and he lived in fear of another parting if he were not lying at her feet or nestling against the soft folds of her gown he was sitting at the door of her room the door that hid her from him the cruel door that kept him from her immediate presence he lay at her bedroom door all night and rushed in with the first entrance of nurse or maid in the morning to greet her with hairy paws upon her coverlet and irresistible canine kisses upon her cheek this was the best love that remained to her the love that had no afterthought and left no sting she had provided a friend for him in days when she would be no longer there francis simeon had promised to take him and love him and give him a happy old age and a gentle sleep when he was weary as the winter days shortened she grew perceptibly weaker and the tired heart felt as if its work in this world must be nearly done mr simeon came every day and stayed for a long time a quiet figure sitting in the low armchair by the wood-fire sometimes 
in silence that was restful for the invalid though she loved to hear him talk for his thoughts were not of this narrow life and its trumpery pleasures and eating cares but of the land beyond the vale do you believe they think of us sometimes those who have gone beyond vera asked in her low sweet voice as they sat in the winter gloaming i believe they think of us often always if they have loved us much i had a friend whom i offended cruelly dreadfully she said slowly as if with an effort and he died before i had even begun to be sorry and when he was dead and i knew that his spirit was there among the shadows near me i was afraid horribly afraid i could only think of his anger never of the possibility of his forgiveness for a long long time i was afraid that i should see him i could imagine the dreadful anger in his face his face and form were always there in the background of my life and i was afraid of being alone afraid of silence and darkness and all lonely places so i gave myself up to society and the amusements and distractions of brainless people without ever really caring for them only to escape thought but i could not stop my brain from thinking thought went on like a relentless iron mill grinding 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 the same dead husks by day and night and the friend whose love i had wounded was always there and then there came a time when i sickened of everything upon earth society splendour music pictures even mountains and lakes and forests and all the beauty of the world all things had become loathsome and i wandered about with a restless spirit in my brain that would not leave me in peace then slowly slowly the faint sweet sense of peace came back the angry face was gone and the face that looked at me out of the shadows was only sad and then the time came when i felt that the dead had changed towards me in that dim world you have taught me to understand and that there was pardon and pity in the great heart i had wounded and one day the burden was lifted from my soul and i knew that i was forgiven now tell me my kind friend was this hallucination was it just the outcome of my brooding thoughts dwelling perpetually upon the same subject or was the spirit of my dead friend really in touch with mine was it by his strong will reaching across the barrier of death that the assurance of forgiveness had come to my soul or was i the dupe of my own imagination my own longing for pardon no you were not deceived it is for such as you that the veil is sometimes lifted the creatures in whom mind is more than flesh the elect of human clay i told you as much as that years ago when you first talked to me of the world we all believe in we who meet together and wait for the voices out of the shadows the wisdom and the faith that cannot die the voices of the influencing minds no my sweet friend have neither fear nor doubt the sense of pity and pardon that has come into your soul is a message from the friend you loved would the happy spirit descend from the realms of light or song should i fear to greet my friend or to say forgive the wrong believe that you are forgiven you can know no more than that until you have passed the river until the gate of a happier world has been opened and then i shall be with him again where they neither marry nor are given in marriage but where they are as the angels of god in heaven that is the reunion to which we all look forward that is the faith that looks through death there was a long interval of silence and then she said slowly if i could see him with these bodily eyes see him as i see you looking at me in the firelight i should be sure that the dream is not a dream you have been privileged to understand the mind of your dead friend to know that he is near you that should be enough only to the rarest natures is it given to see you questioned me about this possibility of vision once before and i told you that i had known of one instance when the eyes of the living beheld the dead 
in the last moments of earthly life i do not think those moments are far off for me my friend vera said softly francis simeon in whose philosophy death was emancipation did not say the kind of thing that susan amphlett would have said in the circumstances she no doubt would have told vera that she was talking nonsense and that she was going to get quite quite well and live for years and years and years and have a real good time mr simeon took her attenuated hand in his friendly grasp and sat by her for some time in silence before he bade her his calm adieu patted the dog nestling against her knees and went quietly out of the room and out of the house he did not think that he would ever again be sitting in the firelight in that room hearing the low sad voice he knew that he had shut the door upon a life that was measured by moments three days after that vera was unwontedly restless there had been a long telegram from her husband in the morning announcing his return for that night he had finished all his business with his trainer engaged the jockeys who were to ride for him next year and he was coming back to london he did not say coming home heartily sick of newmarket and his suffolk shooting and the friends who had been with him why do we do these things and call them pleasures he ended the message with that question as with a moral poor claude sighed his wife as she folded the thin slips of paper and laid them among her books and then she thought how much happier for him if he had stayed with the benedictines the days wore on such slow days the nurses were more and more attentive horribly attentive there were three of them now two were always about her while the third slept she had left off asking questions dr tower came every morning and sat with her quietly for a quarter of an hour and patted and praised her dog and told her scraps of the day's news and was kind but she heard him without interest as if without understanding she had what susy called her mermaid gaze as one who saw only things far away across a vast ocean she never questioned him now and made no allusion to the third young woman in uniform who had come upon the scene so quietly that she looked like a double of one of the others a trick of the optic nerves rather than another person she had the nurses almost always near her and that other sentinel the terrier was there always there was no almost where his affection was concerned as she grew weaker and moved with feebler steps he moved nearer her she talked to him sometimes to the nurses never though she was gracious to them in her mute fashion and understood that they liked her and were sorry for her one quiet grey evening the closing in of a day that had been curiously mild for an english december a day that brought back the still sad atmosphere of midwinter at san marco she had an unusual respite from her watchers it was tea-time and they were sitting longer than usual over the low fire in the room beyond the library with the door ajar no light switched on no sound of laughter or loud voices just two well-behaved young women whispering together in the firelight she was alone moving slowly along the corridor she had been wandering about for some time with a restlessness that had increased in a painful degree of late the dog creeping close against her skirt until all in a moment when she bent down to speak to him he slunk away from her and crawled under the dark archway that opened into the deeper darkness of the hall as vera entered through the open door of the library at last it had come the thing she had been waiting for it was no surprise when the dream she had been dreaming night after night became a reality a shiver ran through her as if the warm blood in her veins had turned to ice-cold water but it was awe not horror that thrilled her night after night she had awakened from a vision of mario provana from the sound of his voice the touch of his hand the glad vivid sense 
that all that was past was a dream that he was alive and that she belonged to him and him only as before the coming of trouble she had awakened night after night in the faint flicker of the shrouded lamp when the room was full of shadows she had awakened to disappointment and desolation that had been the surprise not this there was neither doubt nor wonder now as she stood on the threshold of the dim room and saw provana sitting by the hearth in the chair where he used to sit calm motionless like a statue of domestic peace the creator and defender of the home the master sitting silent by the hearth fire that wedded love had made sacred the dull red of that fading fire and the pale grey of evening outside the uncurtained windows made the only light in the room but there was light enough for her to see every line in the face the face of power where every line told a force unalterable purpose indomitable courage the grey eyes looked at her still bright under the projecting brow kind eyes that told her of his love a love that fate could not change nor diminish not death nor sin for these first moments she believed he had come back to her that he had escaped the bonds of death she did not ask what miracle had brought him there but she believed in his miraculous return the blood ran swift and warm in her veins again her heart beat with a passionate joy she stretched out her arms to him trying to speak fond words of welcome but her tremulous lips could give no sound the muscles of her throat seemed paralyzed she was yearning to tell him of her love that she had sinned and repented that he was the first must always be the first in her affection her limbs failed her with a sudden collapse and she sank on her knees by a large high-backed armchair that stood near the door and clung to the arm of it with both her hands struggling against the numbness that was creeping over her senses she kept her eyes upon the face the face of all her dreams of all her sorrow the face she had loved and regretted for moments her widely opened eyes gazed steadily then cold drops broke out upon her forehead her limbs shook and her eyelids drooped only for an instant she lifted them and he was gone there was nothing but the empty chair his chair in the quiet domestic evenings before mario provana's house became the fashion before the disbrows gave the law to his wife's existence that was the last she saw before the lifting of the veil end of chapter thirty chapter thirty one of beyond these voices this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org beyond these voices by mary elizabeth bratton chapter thirty one Chorus was at work again, not at a London dinner table this time, but in the easier atmosphere of a North Riding manor house, which men left in the morning to shoot grouse, and came back to in the evening to gossip with their womankind, in the cheerful light of an oak-panelled dining room. Chorus was wearing black, quite the prettiest thing in complimentary mourning, which all her friends assured her suited her to perfection, and took ten years of her age. Susan Amphlett had received that kind of compliment too often of late. She thought people were beginning to lay a disagreement stress upon the passage of time in relation to her personal appearance. I doubt if I shall ever wear anything but black for the rest of my poor little life, she said tearfully. That darling and I were like sisters, and that she should have died when I was in Scotland, hundreds of miles away from her. It must have been sudden. Heart failure. No one was with her. She had three hospital nurses to look after her, but she died alone in a dark room, while two of them were dawdling over their tea, and the third was in bed. The dog whined, and they went to look for her. She was lying in a huddled heap on the carpet, near the open door, and that poor, faithful beast was standing by her, whining piteously. Where was Rutherford? 
at Newmarket, of course, the only place where he has been happy for a long time, settling up next year's campaign, who was to write for him, and so on. What had become of the devoted husband you used to tell us about? Does anything last in this decadent age? There never was a more romantic couple than this sweet creature and my cousin Claude three years ago. Their marriage was a poem. Everything about their lives was full of poetry. Their house was the most popular in London. Their chef quite the best. They were all sweetness and light. The most brilliant example of what youth and cleverness and good looks and unlimited money can do. But the good wood before last changed all that. Vera was unweed and run down. The two things go together, don't you know? And broke her engagement to stay with the Waterburys for the race week. Claude went there without her. You all know the sequel, so why recapitulate? Nothing was ever the same after that. Was there an inquest? Asked the host. Thank heaven that wasn't necessary. Her doctor had been seeing her every morning, and knew she might go off at any moment. Heart failure. She was buried in Italy, at a dull little place on the Riviera, in the grave with her first husband and his daughter. Her own wish. She was all poetry to the last, a poet's daughter. From the tragedy of Mrs. Rutherford's early death, the conversation somehow took a retrospective cast. The people talked of the murder that had happened a long time before. It is curious how long the interest in a murder may survive. If the murderer has not been discovered, there always remains something to wonder about. After nearly half a dozen years, the Provana murder could still bear discussion. People's pet theories seemed as fresh as ever, and were discussed with as much animation. While those people who had theories which they would die rather than divulge were the most interesting of all the theorists, for they could be driven to ground with close questioning. As in the familiar game of clumps, until they made a resolute stand, and refused to say another word upon the subject. I dare say it is quite horrid of me to think what I think," said one vivacious lady, "and you would hate me if I were to tell you. Give us the chance, at any rate; it will be a new sensation for you to be hated. One thing at least I may say." It has always been a mystery to me how those two people could bear to live in that house. Oh, but you cannot bar a fine house and your own property, because your husband has been unlucky enough to get himself murdered in it. Here, Chorus, who had sat disapproving and even angry, while her friends were discussing the murder, chipped in suddenly. You don't know Vera, she said. Her memory of Pravana was an absolute coot. And she loved the house for his sake. It's a pity she kept her worship for the husband's memory," said somebody. "For the state of things between her and Rutherford for some years was an open secret. Everybody knew all about it. Nobody knew Vera as I knew her. She had no more of common earth in her composition than if she had been a sylph. People might as well talk scandal about Undine. The men of the world who were present." And the woman who knew nearly as much of life smiled and shrugged their shoulders. Well, it is all ancient history," said a bland worldling with smooth white hair and a smooth elderly voice. The romantic friendship, the murder, the marriage with the romantic friend, du las, du cas, du pas. Nothing can matter to anybody now. Nothing except who killed Signora Provana," said the lady who had declared she would sooner die than tell anybody her theory of the murder. End of chapter thirty-one. Chapter thirty-two of Beyond These Voices. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Beyond these voices by Mary Elizabeth Braddon, Chapter Thirty-Two. 
father cyprian hammond sat alone in the winter gloaming after a hard day's work in his parish which was a large one covering several of those obscure little slums that lie hidden behind handsome streets in northwestern london the table had been cleared after his short and simple dinner and he was half reclining in his deep arm-chair while sabatier's life of st francis of assisi lay open on the table under the candles that made only a spot of light in the lofty room it was one of the books which he opened often on an evening of fatigue and depression the life or the fioretti were books that rested his brain and soothed his spirits he lay back in his chair with his eyes closed not asleep but resting and listening with a kind of sensuous pleasure to the light fall of wood ashes on the hearth his winter fire of old ship logs was one of the few luxuries he allowed himself i told you i would see no one to-night he said as his servant came into the room it is mr rutherford father only just back from italy he said he was sure you would see him very good i will see mr rutherford you can light the lamp come in claude he called to the figure standing outside the door claude came into the room while the servant lighted a standard lamp of considerable power that shone full upon a face from which all natural carnation had changed to an ashen greyness the face of a man in the last stage of a bad illness you look dead beat said the priest as they clasped hands you have been travelling night and day i suppose i came straight from her grave from their grave she lies in the cemetery at san marco beside her husband and his daughter the girl who loved her and whose love brought those two together it was her wish i conclude there was a letter found a letter written half a year ago at the beginning of her illness in which she begged that i would lay her there in his grave nowhere else it was he that she loved best always always her real her only perfect love was for him may that absolve her of her sins i would have done much striven long and late to bring her into the fold if she would have let me but she would not well she shall not want for an intercessor while i live and pray and then looking up at his visitor who stood before him a tragical figure in the bright hard light of the lamp his face haggard and wan against the rich darkness of his sable collar sit down claude he said gently in a tone of ineffable compassion the voice that day by day had spoken to sorrow and to sin i see you have come to tell me your troubles take off that heavy coat and draw your chair to the fire and open your heart to me unless indeed you will come to my confessional to-morrow and let me hear you there i would much rather you did that selon les regles no be kind father and let me talk to you here i will keep nothing back this time there shall be no more secrets no surprises i have come to the end of my book she is dead and i have nothing left to care about nothing left to hide there is not a joy this world can offer a man for which i would hold up a finger now she is gone what do you want me to do for you what you did for me six years ago open the gate of a refuge where a sinner may hide the remnant of a worthless life where i may spend the last dregs in the cup drop by drop where i may die day by day on my knees in penitential prayer i opened that gate you were safe in such a refuge and you broke out again and came back to the world twenty times worse than you were before the life you have been leading since you married provana's widow is about the most worthless the most abject life that a reasonable being could lead the life of empty pleasure of sensuality and self-indulgence a life that debases the man himself and corrupts and ruins 
his associates i had to forget if all that the world calls pleasure could have been distilled into one little drug that would have blotted out remembrance i should have wanted no more race-horses no more racing yachts no more flying machines no more cards or dice only that one little drug father when i stood before you six years ago in this room a miserable wretch i had to keep my secret for her sake i have nothing to hide now it was i who killed mario provana i knew you knew yes i knew that night as much as i know now i knew the guilt you wanted to hide in a cloister i knew your sin and your remorse but i doubted your perseverance a doubt that was too speedily justified by the event it was the fatal course my mother took she brought vera to the place where i thought that i and my sin were buried i did not yield without a struggle in long days of depression in long nights of fever i wrestled with satan for my soul i called upon my manhood my honour my will-power i even thought that i had conquered and then in an instant my passionate heart gave way and i walked out of that house of rest a fallen spirit but oh the rapture of the moment when i held her in my arms and told her that i renounced all the hope of heaven the certainty of peace for her love oh the pity of it my unhappy claude you ask me no questions father to what end you are not in the confessional there may be details that would in some degree mitigate your guilt but murder is a heinous sin and i fear in your case it had been led up to by guilt almost as dark the spoiling of a pure woman's soul if the murder was not deliberate you cannot urge the same excuse for the sin of seduction that sin which includes every abomination hypocrisy the falsehood that betrays a trusting fellow-creature the calculating cruelty that sets a man's strength of will against a woman's yielding love no 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 father have you forgotten those two lost souls dante saw driven through the malignant air they who had stained the earth with blood sorrow and sin had been theirs but francesca's lover was not a deliberate seducer and even in that world of pain the love that linked those two who never could be parted more was no base or selfish passion no man ever fought a harder battle than i fought for her sake i loved her when we were boy and girl together when she was a child a lovely innocent child who gave me her heart in that happy morning of life who had been shut out from all the affection that makes childhood beautiful the caresses the praise of an adoring mother the love of father brothers sisters she had known nothing better than the tepid kindness of a peevish old woman and she gave her heart to me in the first joyous days of her life i taught her what youth and happiness meant and that springtime of our lives was never forgotten vera was the romance of my boyhood i carried her image in my heart for all the years in which we were strangers and when fate brought us together again our hearts went out to each other as if the years had never parted us as if she had been still as unconscious of passion as the child who clambered on my knee and flung her arms round my neck on the rocks at disbrow but with a certain difference said the priest she was mario provana's wife i did not forget that i told myself that i need never forget it she was the centre of a selfish clan who meant to run her for all she was worth i knew to what account the disbrows would turn a millionaire cousin and i took upon myself to stand between her and a herd of cold-hearted relations who only valued her as a counter in the social game 
except susan amphlett who is a fool and lady oakhampton who is not much wiser there was not one of the crew that had a spark of real regard for her and you thought your affection was pure enough to save her from all the pitfalls of society i thought that i was strong enough to take a brother's place i had lived my life i had been a failure i had sinned and paid forfeit for my sin i thought i had done with passionate feeling and that i could trust myself as fully as vera trusted me in her absolute unconsciousness of danger i was deceived the fire still burned in the grey ashes of a wasted life and the time came when it burst into flame and consumed us you were with her that night when provana came home unexpectedly i was with her no matter how that came about the die had been cast weeks before when she and i were at the oakhamptons river villa we were alone there as if we had been in a wood and our secret was told and our promise was exchanged nothing was to matter any more in our lives except our love we were to go to the other side of the world and cruise about in the south seas till we found an island as stevenson did a paradise of love and peace to end our days in the yacht was waiting for us at plymouth manned and found for an ocean voyage almost as fine a vessel as the gloriana we were to start by an early train that morning i wrung a promise from her at lady fulham's ball and we met a few hours earlier than we had intended and he found you together and you killed him it was her life or his we faced each other at the door of his dressing-room the other door was open and the lights were on i saw death in his face as he stood for a moment looking into her room the white dumb rage that means bloodshed he gave me only one contemptuous glance as he dashed past me to the desk where his pistol case was ready for him he had the pistol in his hand and had cocked it in what had seemed an instant and was on his way to her room while i snatched the second pistol from the case for me he could bide his time for her doom was to be swift i think i read him right even in those fierce moments his fury was measured by the love he had given her his foot was on the threshold when i fired i could hear her stifled sobs as she lay on the floor where she had fallen at the sound of his footsteps on the landing half unconscious in her agony of shame she told me afterwards that strange lights were in her eyes a roar of waters in her ears she was lying in a world of red light well what do you want of me now open the door of my cell the benedictines the carthusians la trappe in france or spain any order where the rule is iron and where my days will be short i have lived the sinner's life and it has not brought me happiness let me live the saint's life and see if it can bring me peace i am not a much blacker sinner than some of the fathers of your church who wear the aureole let the rest of my life be one long act of expiation one dark night of penitential prayer my dear claude my son all shall be done for you the path of peace shall be made smooth but this time there must be no turning back to what should i come back the light of my life has gone out epilogue a month later when christmas was over and the people who had done with their guns and did not mean hunting were making a little season in london on their way to egypt or the riviera lady susan amphlett as chorus was in her best form at cosy dinners now will you believe that claude rutherford was a devoted husband and that he broke his heart when his wife died she asked triumphantly 
i believe that he was nearly as much of a crank as his pretty wife she was a disciple of francis simeon and he was under father hammond's thumb the dark room in the albany or a cell in la trappe there's not much difference from a racing stable to a cloister is a bit of a leap in the dark claude was always a bold rider i've seen him skylarking over a hedge on his way home without knowing where he was to land i think he is rather lucky to land in a cloister said the lady who had refused to tell people her theory of the provana murder but i wonder what they think of it all in scotland yard End of chapter thirty two. End of Beyond the Voices by Mary Elizabeth Braddon.